to this important uh, lecture series. ICR lecture series of this 75 lectures. And I, on behalf of Indian Council of Agriculture Research, I welcome all of you for this lecture series. Today, as you know, we have very important lecture and that lecture is by none other than our uh, well-known personality, the former uh, Secretary Dare and DG ICR, who is uh, uh, going to give this uh, lecture, uh, which is uh, 74th uh, in the uh, lecture series. Uh, friends, this lecture, uh, as I told you, uh, is 74th in the lecture series. And uh, today uh, we have uh, our Secretary Dayar and DG ICR, uh, Dr. Himanshu Patak, who will chair this uh, lecture. And the topic of uh, today's lecture is Science for the Society, the Agricultural Imperatives. A very important topic in which Dr. Mohapatra has a lot of experience. He's a well known scientist, well known policymaker well-known administrator and a excellent human being. Uh, friends, as you know, Dr. Mahapatra, uh, he has done his uh, undergraduate from uh, Odisha University of Agriculture Technology and MSc and PhD in genetics uh, from uh, Indian Agriculture Research Institute, a very uh, well-known institute in the field of agriculture. And he's a well-known scientist also, uh, in the field of genome sequencing, you know, a, a very first high-yielding uh, high basmati rice variety uh, resistant to bacterial uh, leaf blight uh, was developed uh, by him. And he has been uh, involved in this uh, genome sequencing of uh, rice, tomato, and uh, he has worked, he has extensively worked in the frontier areas of genomics, phenomics, bioprospecting of genes, allele mining, and many more areas. And if you attend his lectures, I think he's one of the best teachers, one of the teachers liked by students, uh, like anything. So, uh, and students, again and again, want to listen to him. The lecture is for half an hour. Uh, students would like to listen to him for two hours, for three hours, and continuously. So it's a, a great opportunity for us that we will be able to listen to him, uh, to listen to his uh, experiences, uh, about this uh, science and many more uh, great ideas uh, we are going to uh, get from him. And I will request uh, Dr. Himanshu Patak, uh, Secretary Dare and DG ICR to chair and to uh, say a few words before we uh, request Dr. Mahapatra to uh, deliver his lecture. So Dr. Himanshu Patak, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you very much, uh, respected uh, Dr. Mahapatra. I see many of our mentors present today, Professor R.B. Singhji, Dr. P.L. Gautam, many of our honorable vice chancellors, directors, scientists, technical staff, and of course, very importantly, our students. First of all, let me thank Dr. Mahapatra for kindly agreeing to deliver this important talk on this very special occasion. Friends, all of you know that science and society, these two are closely related, very, very closely related. There was a time when science and society were working in two different poles. But now the time has come when all the scientific activities should be fully amalgamated with the societal needs, with the societal needs. So science should be guided by the societal needs and at many times, society also should be guided by scientific developments. You know, our constitution, particularly Article 51 AH, which says for developing scientific temper and spirit of inquiry among all the citizens, so that the scientific temper could be promoted with the citizens and the society will be developing Scientifically, whatever we'll be doing should be backed by science. Whatever development and aspirations we'll, we all we will be having should also be guided by science. And today, when Dr. Mahapatra is going to talk on this particular topic, I was really very, 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 very happy, happy to know that he has chosen this particular topic. Friends, uh, 
if you see the development of science and society, you will also notice that the science has been developing at an enormous pace rather. There is one estimate that in every 10 years, scientific knowledge almost doubles every 10 years. And you can have some other numbers. But the societal developments, particularly in the field of scientific development of the society, has not taken place in that speed. So there is a need when society and the scientists should be working very, very closely. And when we talk of agriculture, there is, of course, there is no point that agriculture can be separated scientifically from the society because it is a part and parcel of whole societal development. Friends, I shall not stand between Dr. Mahapatra and all of you. He is one of the luminaries of Indian agriculture, has been guiding the whole agriculture research and development system of the country for the last uh, many years, I would say more than three decades or so. And it will be a great pleasure for all of us to listen to Dr. Mahapatra today. So I request Dr. Mahapatra to kindly deliver this particular talk. Over to Dr. Mahapatra, please. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, about it, uh, let me thank Dr. Rukarwal for uh, insisting that I should be here while initiating this series of uh, lectures now quite famous. Um, we never realized the gravity of it. And while committing that we will have uh, 75 lectures, one in every week, uh, we were uh, oblivious of the fact that it is very tough to not only manage speakers, good speakers, but also having sufficient audience to listen to the lectures. And uh, given the uh, dimensions uh, and complexities, uh, so we thought probably inviting speakers from fields which are not really directly related to agriculture would enthuse uh, a large section of the clientele, scientists, students, and others uh, who would uh, uh, be uh, uh, attending this. Uh, but, uh, you know, that uh, uh, was not always successful. Uh, you know, not uh, very huge attendance at times, but uh, very well received uh, by a majority of uh, our, uh, you know, colleagues uh, who have accepted this as a very uh, successful program. And uh, so that is how we, we express, uh, you know, our satisfaction that, uh, you know, we have been able to run this through, uh, you know, uh, come to 74th uh, lecture today. And uh, you know, going to finish in another lecture, uh, the 75th one to be delivered by Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thanks to Dr. Agrawal uh, for uh, taking up this responsibility and doing this uh, very sincerely, religiously, uh, without missing uh, any opportunity, and always being there in all the lectures to uh, manage it. Uh, uh, and thanks to uh, his colleagues uh, in the division. And today we have uh, many other uh, mentors, luminaries, uh, Professor R.B. Singh and Dr. Uh, Gautam, uh, P.L. Gautam, and many others, Honorable Vice Chancellors, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Patak, uh, Director General, Indian Council of Agriculture Research and Secretary Dare, have been here with us. So when uh, I was uh, asked to do something, so since uh, I have been, you know, associated with this and uh, spearheading this, so I didn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, very seriously, uh, you know, take this lecture because I thought it would be, you know, I can speak on anything. But when it comes to 
uh, you know, or the, uh, you know, specifics and details and uh, to, uh, the, to, for the, uh, the, and the, the time of delivery comes nearer, then you start thinking seriously what to really uh, talk about. And Dr. Agrawal keeps insisting that I give a topic. So I thought I'll manage without a topic, but he said that, uh, you know, I have to give a topic. And Dr. Pathak says that this is timely. And in fact, uh, I was uh, reluctant. And then I thought probably, you know, I can speak something without much preparation, uh, you know. So anyway, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, all of you who have joined today, and uh, thank you for joining. And uh, hopefully I would be able to communicate to you uh, effectively what I intend to actually uh, 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 intend to do. And uh, I think uh, in my best judgment it would be relevant uh, to uh, the context uh, uh, of India and particularly Indian society and farmers and agriculture, uh, very specifically if we uh, you know, want to really uh, you know, take any message uh, from today's, uh, you know, deliberation. Uh, if you see the uh, uh, Indian uh, situation, the society at large, and how we are actually doing, uh, we are doing uh, a fairly good job. Uh, we have done in the past, uh, you know, with regard to the societal uh, benefit and that must accrue. How do you actually measure uh, this uh, you know, uh, development? So obviously there are several parameters uh, to uh, measure developments. Uh, so one such parameter uh, is the uh, poverty uh, and how we have actually addressed or addressing poverty, uh, both in uh, rural settings, uh, rural areas, and also urban areas. Uh, the recent World Bank report, uh, uh, some of you might have seen and read, and what it says, it says that the extreme poverty uh, has declined uh, uh, in India. And uh, 2011, uh, uh, it was 22.5%, uh, uh, and which has come down to 10.2%, uh, in 2019. Uh, and uh, very importantly, decline in rural area uh, is much higher, uh, much faster decline has happened uh, at the rate of 14.7%. Uh, in fact, that is the quantum of decline rather. And as compared to urban area, urban poverty, which is uh, about 7.7% uh, you know, or 9%. So this uh, faster rate uh, has been uh, not only in rural area, but also faster rate uh, to the extent of 3% uh, has been uh, uh, noticed uh, during the period, for instance, 2017 to 19. So very encouraging one, uh, but certainly uh, COVID uh, came as a spoiler, uh, putting breaks uh, in this rate uh, in decline of poverty. And uh, so obviously there were uh, bottlenecks. I'm not going to those details, but what I would uh, like to highlight here that one of the important parameters of countries' development and uh, society uh, progressing uh, well is the measurement of poverty. And that is uh, declining as per the World Bank report. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, if you see uh, uh, a, a kind of uh, analysis which is a bit different, uh, which takes into account uh, multiple uh, dimensions and factors uh, that is called multidimensional uh, uh, poverty uh, you know, uh, uh, index. Uh, so MDPI, uh, as has been used by Niti Aayog. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, says that uh, about 25% of Indians uh, are multidimensionally poor. So the society uh, still uh, is relatively poor. And when they are uh, considering multidimensionality, they take into account uh, even health, uh, you know, education, 
uh, standard of living and so on and so forth. And in fact, there are 12 uh, segments, uh, you know, including say electricity uh, and uh, drinking water, uh, bank account and so on and so forth. So there are uh, several, uh, you know, kind of uh, aspects, uh, segments and the factors uh, which are uh, included uh, in this uh, analysis uh, of uh, multidimensional uh, uh, poverty uh, index. Uh, so, so this uh, also very importantly says that the rural poverty, uh, you know, uh, is much higher, and uh, 32, 33 percent of rural population uh, is uh, poor, multidimensionally poor rather, and uh, as compared to urban. Uh, population, and which is about uh, eight to uh, nine percent, eight point eight percent or so. So, uh, so that is uh, you know the comparison between urban uh, India and rural India. But average is about twenty five percent. That is multidimensional uh, poverty. Uh, so the society at large, uh, you know, if you see, uh, though progressing well, there is decline. But uh, if you consider, as it is being considered globally, uh, the uh, various uh, facets of living, uh, if you take into account uh, poverty persists and uh, substantially at a higher level, and if you compare with other countries, so we are actually lagging behind. And obviously, uh, uh, you know, this uh, report, uh, uh, I'm uh, quoting uh, the TI report because uh, it uh, tells us many things. And when I talk of agricultural imperatives, so some of these uh, would guide us uh, where uh, we should be actually moving and where we should be really focusing. What should be most essential uh, to actually be dealt uh, by uh, with, uh, all of us and more so by the policymakers. The regional disparity is so huge. And if you see uh, Bihar, uh, multidimensional uh, poverty uh, to the tune of 50 percent, 50 percent of the 52 percent of the population, and uh, followed by Jharkhand, where 42 percent are being a multidimensionally poor. And this is, uh, you know, something uh, if you contrast with the Kerala, about one percent being multidimensionally poor. And it's a great deal. There are states like Tamil Nadu, for instance, uh, and uh, many other states which would be less than, uh, you know, five six uh, percent. Uh, poverty, uh, poor. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, tells us that there's a gross uh, disparity across regions, and uh, this tells us that there's a lot more uh, need to be really done uh, to address uh, poverty. And uh, poverty means obviously uh, there is uh, nutrition, there is health, uh, and uh, there is uh, education and the standard of living. Uh, even uh, you know uh, uh, various facets of it and divided in twelve segments, all included. And if you see the burden of malnutrition, if you extend this further, uh, you know oh, that's again a glaring. Uh, Bihar again, fifty-two percent uh, are deprived of nutrition, adequate nutrition, and that's again a big challenge. Uh, followed by again Jharkhand, about forty-eight percent and uh, seeking a uh, minimum of about 13%. And uh, that is again uh, in a particular uh, specific age group of children, uh, women and men uh, in that. And if anyone interested can look at it, this report, and then see that how uh, you know, the poverty uh, still prevails and to what extent uh, this uh, you know, disparity is glaring and, uh, and how uh, we have to really plan uh, and uh, I know not only in isolation, but center, state, uh, and other institutions and global institutions coming together to plan it out so that we address uh, this uh, single most important uh, aspect of uh, societal development and progress that is uh, you know, measured by multidimensional uh, poverty. Uh, of course, uh, nutrition, uh, you know, is uh, very, very important. The National uh, Family Health Survey 5 uh, and how it compares with the National Family Health Survey 4. Uh, uh, many of us know, Professor R.B. Singh uh, keeps citing. Uh, and uh, just very briefly, if I have to mention that uh, how 
uh, we are actually slipping uh, into a more serious uh, situation despite all efforts uh, that are being made uh, and uh, due to various reasons. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, the uh, central government is uh, focusing on ocean vision and so, so many other uh, kind of schemes, uh, fortification of uh, uh, main staple like rice and so on and so forth. Anemia among children under the age of five uh, increasing alarmingly. Uh, in fact, uh, two in every uh, uh, three uh, children uh, uh, in the, this age group are being anemic. And uh, you know, that's something is quite uh, you know, serious. And uh, even among uh, you know, uh, men and women, uh, this is uh, also uh, increasing. Uh, similarly, obesity uh, is increasing. I'll not go into the details of data, but obesity increasing and uh, uh, various other factors, uh, whether it is uh, fertility, uh, which is uh, declining, and uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, all these uh, nutrition and uh, factors, if you take into account, uh, and then it, it uh, tells us that uh, it's uh, far more challenging than what uh, it used to be with regard to nutrition. Uh, though, as I said, fertility is uh, declining and uh, it's uh, uh, almost uh, at the uh, replacement rate. Uh, so we are going to stabilize as a population uh, uh, you know, sooner, uh, but uh, during this uh, period, uh, 25 years, when we celebrate 100 years of uh, independence, uh, you, you, Honorable Prime Minister has rightly called us Amrit Kal, and how do we really manage uh, these uh, uh, important uh, problems, uh, you know, poverty, malnutrition, uh, and so on and so forth, and uh, bring in uh, much uh, more development uh, you know, uh, in years to come. Uh, you know, there are many uh, studies uh, by other agencies, for instance, uh, International uh, Food Policy Research Institute. There are a number of reports, number of, uh, you know, kind of deliberations, and, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, uh, concerning agriculture and uh, how agriculture, uh, you know, uh, is related to uh, poverty alleviation. There are numerous studies in different countries uh, revealing and global studies also revealing that agricultural development uh, does address uh, you know, poverty and leads to uh, poverty reduction uh, uh, very significantly. <clears throat> uh, uh, so uh, particularly uh, uh, when there is an increase in productivity, uh, you know, obviously that leads to enhanced production, uh, so enhanced income in many instances, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, leads to a reduction of poverty. So, so all these, uh, you know, uh, many of you know, might have studied in detail. I will not go to those details of report of IPRI, and you can actually look at it uh, if you are interested at how agriculture uh, 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 as uh, you know, a profession as an enterprise, uh, and uh, more than uh, you know, fifty percent of our population directly, indirectly, depending on agriculture, uh, becomes uh, you know crucial uh, for poverty uh, reduction. Uh, but I'll come to this point, uh, you know, with regard to uh, agricultural imper imperatives uh, later. But uh, coming to the uh, uh, the second aspect of uh, the title that when the society at large and Indian, India in particular, uh, I was highlighting uh, where we are and how do we measure our progress and development. And certainly uh, there is uh, you know, uh, progress happening uh, with regard to reduction of poverty, but still there are challenges with regard to nutrition, uh, challenges with regard to other aspects of multidimensionality uh, of poverty. Uh, you know, our government is uh, trying uh, uh, best, and obviously, uh, you know, you can take few examples and how government effort uh, is uh, directed at reducing uh, multidimensional poverty in the country. For instance, access to clean uh, fuel uh, for cooking has increased from 18% of the population in two, 2012 uh, to 54% of the population in 2020. 
So mere 18% in 2012 to 54% in 2020. And this is one of the considerations of the multidimensionality of the poverty. <clears throat> so there's a long way to go because 46% of the population uh, is still using methods uh, 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 of cooking, uh, which uh, uh, actually is not really based on clean food. Uh, so a long way to go, but uh, if you compare where we were, we are certainly progressing. And similarly, if you see access to safe drinking water, uh, it has also made a very significant jump up from 46% in 2012 to 56% of the population in 2020. So in many other aspects, uh, if you see, uh, because of the emphasis of the current government, uh, it is actually uh, you know, leading us in the direction of reducing multidimensionality uh, of poverty. And I'm sure uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, long-term and in, in fact, medium-term uh, you know, uh, prospects are quite uh, uh, bright. And I'm sure as we go along, we should be able to see uh, that uh, uh, you know, we address this uh, in time to uh, come. <clears throat> Uh, uh, the, the, the other aspect of the title is that science uh, providing uh, uh, you know, solace uh, and supporting uh, all the efforts of the government, the non-government organizations and everybody concerned uh, to address the problems of the society. And that is known, that is known uh, for a pretty long time. Uh, uh, always time would be limiting, and so uh, today is no exception. So time is actually flying very fast. So I may not be able to really put emphasis, adequate emphasis on each one of them. But uh, you know, uh, let me uh, briefly mention that how the science uh, as a component of uh, civilization uh, uh, has been there uh, and contributing very significantly if you uh, see the Indus Valley civilization, Manjadaru, Hrapa, and all that, that how, <clears throat> how these uh, you know, uh, uh, civilizations uh, have uh, really used science uh, for uh, meeting their needs. Uh, in those days, uh, in whatever form of science it is, innovations it is, it was, uh, they were, uh, used extensively. Uh, if you talk of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the wheel-drawn pottery system in Indus Valley civilization, painting and glazing of potteries uh, in Indus Valley civilization. And uh, in fact, uh, the uh, bead making, for instance, uh, cutting, drilling, polishing of beads, and all these were so well known and so well done and uh, quite amazing to see that uh, the innovative ideas, and uh, in fact, uh, they, they were not uh, formally educated, but still those innovative minds were still working and uh, there were innovations. And uh, you know, if you see uh, the evidences which are there and uh, are gathered over a period of time and how the fast tidal port at uh, Lothal of Gujarat uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, was there, uh, and uh, how uh, the shipyards uh, were made, uh, and similarly, uh, the standardized system of weights and then measures which were being used, uh, uh, burnt bricks which were produced and used uh, in uh, making uh, houses. So, so many other aspects, even in agriculture, uh, you know, huge of season, growing, cultivating them and using the oil as a cooking medium and consuming oil of sesame and using them for other purposes, cotton spinning and uh, fabrication. And uh, similarly, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated water conservation. There are many other uh, civilizational requirements, the sustenance needs of those civilizations. And they were true in uh, you know, all the civilizations. And in fact, they uh, persisted and flourished uh, you know, uh, near the banks of rivers and water, big water bodies. And that says that uh, they, they uh, uh, did uh, understood the centrality of water, the importance of our water 
in survival, survival of the civilizations. And in fact, uh, you know, the health uh, requirements were also met and science was actually applied there, uh, you know, uh, through obviously, uh, you know, practice and uh, uh, understanding and how uh, the uh, practice of, for instance, uh, you know, boring through the skull, uh, drilling through the skull uh, can cure, uh, you know, uh, ailments. Uh, and also, uh, in fact, uh, stitching together the broken skull and so on and so forth. So there were evidences and use of science in health and agriculture uh, in day-to-day -day require meeting day-to-day -day requirements and uh, uh, you know so on and so forth. So the civilizational needs and development of civilization, sustenance of civilizations, uh, you know, um, uh, required uh, application of innovations, uh, science, and uh, building making technologies. Uh, to help them and to, to, to sustain that. So, so these are all examples, and there are plenty of such examples. In recent times, so you talk of uh, the LCD display system in our, in our computers uh, or uh, in our uh, mobiles, and how LEDs are being used in backlight uh, provisioning, and uh, how uh, you know, uh, we are using lithium batteries uh, and so on and so forth, and uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning work and how society has benefited. There are n number of examples, and I don't want to really go into those details to highlight how science uh, uh, contributes to uh, society's development and the societal needs uh, are met. And uh, uh, we are not far behind in agriculture, and uh, you know, the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, you know, uh, in peace or for peace, uh, you know, rather in peace, uh, you know, uh, in the year 1970 uh, for uh, Norman Bolin uh, highlights that how uh, science-driven agriculture was important for uh, driving away uh, hunger uh, uh, and, uh, you know, addressing malnutrition in the process uh, in those days, in 60s, uh, and 70s. And you know that uh, how, uh, you know, uh, addressing this uh, global hunger uh, and the process, uh, you know, of, for global peace and how it was recognized. And you all know that uh, it was not just introducing uh, some high yielding seeds uh, varieties in India, but the science behind that, the Norintin of Japan, uh, developed by uh, Inaja, Inajuka, and then subsequently moving that, moving to US, uh, you know, uh, and then being worked upon by Vogel at Washington State University, and uh, crosses being made uh, using Norin 10, the semi dwarf uh, wheat line, carrying RST, RST1 and RST2 genes, and combining that with other uh, traits uh, in US by way of crossing with other US varieties and for providing some of those seeds uh, you know, uh, to Norman Bowler to work on further hybridization utilizing uh, uh, you know, Mexican uh, lines uh, with the F2 derived lines, uh, which were generated by Vogel and combining uh, disease resistance, high yield, fertilizer responsiveness, uh, stiff uh, you know, straw trait, and so on and so forth, uh, you know, in those lines and which were supplied uh, in the form of Lan Marlojo and, uh, and, and uh, Sonora 6364 and so on and so forth to India. So, so very well thought out science. In fact, the uh, breeding program of Norman Borlaug, if you see how subtle breeding worked, how selection multiple environments and multiple seasons and years worked, how selections could be very robustly carried out, and uh, those uh, lines which are tested there, further tested in India, thanks to Professor M. S. Swaminathan at the age of 38, writing to Dr. Bowler to provide those lines, and uh, you know, uh, and rest is history, and all of you know that how uh, we had this, uh, you know, revolution and doubling of uh, production uh, in four or five years' time, uh, you know, in India. Uh, with regard to wheat and similar development happening uh, in rice. So science-led development 
and uh, you know leading to societal development and uh, of course uh, you know uh, uh, ultimately contributing to uh, you know hunger and malnutrition and poverty to a certain extent uh, uh, being addressed so so this is uh, these are the some of the examples which we have seen we know very well and uh, you know uh, the, nothing to highlight more than uh, seeing it and uh, as we have developed subsequently in the area of agriculture. So science-led development uh, is the essence uh, of uh, uh, any country and whether it is agriculture or uh, other fields. And uh, what is that uh, we need to really do uh, uh, to further this uh, in the context of India? And what are the uh, imperatives uh, with regard to agriculture? Uh, and how do we actually address this? And so that uh, in years to come, uh, the uh, uh, needs are adequately met and society uh, with regard to poverty, with regard to malnutrition, and with regard to various other related aspects uh, are actually met. Uh, you all know the challenges that uh, we have uh, before us. Uh, of course, uh, challenges of uh, climate change is very much well understood, and you all know that how serious, how important it is. And uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, kind of climate change that we see uh, that uh, we may add uh, more poor people uh, by 2030, and it is estimated that maybe another 100 million people would be uh, added globally. Uh, to the uh, poor people that are there, uh, more than 800 million, which are there already at the global level. Uh, uh, as, uh, and similarly, uh, the way the conflicts that you see at the global level, and uh, you know the way it is pushing uh, people uh, to uh, you know uh, live under marginalized conditions, and uh, you know suffering with regard to uh, poor nutrition, hunger. And that is all very visible. And uh, that uh, conflict uh, you know, uh, uh, has happened in the past. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, also going to happen uh, in future. In 2017, uh, eight, 821 million were hungry uh, due to drought primarily, and also due to armed conflict. That's the uh, estimate. And uh, a current world, between Ukraine and Russia, you have seen you have seen how food su supply system, uh, you know, was uh, impacted, and obviously COVID, uh, which is uh, another important example uh, of uh, the challenge uh, in the form of emerging, uh, you know, diseases, emerging diseases with regard to animals, emerging diseases with regard to human, and also with regard to plants. And uh, the total, uh, you know, ecosystem getting uh, impacted uh, because of uh, such, uh, you know, challenging emerging diseases. And I'm sure all of you know. And the recent, uh, you know, case of lumpy skin disease uh, in case of uh, animals. Uh, you know, uh, we uh, noticed this challenge in 2019, and started working on this. Uh, and today we have a vaccine. And it was released uh, 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 two days before by Honorable Agriculture Minister. So, so, so that's the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, um, uh, imperative needs uh, which are there and has to be recognized early and addressed uh, squarely. And we have to head on face such challenges. I'll come back to this point later, but uh, it is to mention mention uh, that uh, emerging diseases in the form of COVID. Uh, which uh, actually, uh, you know, puts us, uh, the whole society, uh, in a very big disadvantage. Uh, there are many challenges. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, African swine fever, fever in case of uh, pigs. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, even uh, there are uh, new viral diseases which are emerging in China, for instance, which are supposed to be zoonotic in nature. So uh, unless we address this, uh, probably, uh, uh, we will not be able to have holistic development. The multidimensionality of poverty 
uh, cannot be addressed uh, you know, uh, if we are not really safeguarding uh, against uh, such uh, you know, kind of deviations uh, and uh, challenges which are there all around. And of course, uh, as we go on, as the purchasing power increases, uh, we will have diversified food needs and food habits are going to change. And as we see uh, the demand for cereals uh, you know, as an energy source is declining, but at the same time, uh, you know, a little disturbance uh, this year uh, with regard to high uh, temperature rise and impacting negatively wheat production uh, has placed a, a big challenge before us. So we can't just neglect that particular aspect, but still, you know, uh, despite the decline, we have to meet the requirements of uh, the uh, staple food needs of the country. And, uh, you know, uh, and, but at the same time, uh, meet the diversified food needs. And the nutrition challenge would the country uh, need to be there with us and COVID and the other uh, uh, challenges uh, being there with us, uh, you know, uh, unhygienic uh, living lifestyles and so on and so forth uh, would uh, place us in a gross disadvantage. There are many, many lectures which highlight all these so I'll not really go into these de de uh, details, but they are all there before us. A land degradation, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, the way things are happening and uh, how, uh, you know, more than 100 million uh, hectares uh, of uh, uh, about, 100, uh, about 130 million hectares uh, of net zone area being degraded in this country and topsoil being lost. So it's a very big challenge uh, before us. And if you want to really meet the societal needs with regard to food and address uh, the uh, poverty, malnutrition, and uh, have a, a developed society, and uh, how do we really do this? Unless we have sustained uh, food production and unless we have a healthy uh, society uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and similarly, what are needs of the society? How do we really meet? And uh, the way we are consuming water, and by 2050, uh, half of the uh, water available in lakes and rivers and in aquifers, uh, uh, underground, and they will be used for agriculture. And uh, when you say that they are being used for agriculture, uh, so how do we really manage, uh, you know, uh, that? And water resource, uh, you know, uh, and the quality of that uh, is going to uh, decline. Uh, so obviously, these are all challenges before us. And uh, what are those agricultural imperatives? Uh, uh, keeping that in mind so that uh, we uh, meet the societal needs uh, at the same time, uh, sustainably, uh, we do this. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the challenge of uh, food production is there, but at the same time, food loss uh, is a very big challenge. And uh, uh, to the extent of it's being lost uh, during, uh, you know, uh, uh, supply, uh, particularly uh, in the retail, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, the level of uh, con consumer, uh, you know, which is to the tune of 30%. Uh, and uh, the production level, our uh, CPET uh, has done assessment, uh, you know, uh, horticulture particularly produce being lost and all those details are there. I'm not going to those. Uh, so, so obviously, the challenges are many. I cited a few of them. There are many, many challenges uh, and how science needs to be really mainstream, so has to be capitalized to meet the, and meet the challenges and uh, uh, meet the requirements of the society. And uh, in the process, uh, you know, uh, make the society prosperous, reduce poverty and, uh, you know, uh, reduce malnutrition. Uh, the first important, uh, you know, agricultural imperative I would like to emphasize often, uh, given our past experience and given the examples I cited, uh, you know, uh, is uh, the innovation and uh, technological imperatives, uh, innovation imperative uh, in uh, agriculture. Uh, it has been mainstreamed in the past, but what extent we can uh, be further innovative and think out of box. 
And obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is plenty of opportunity and scope for all of us uh, to innovate further. Uh, there are many recent examples, and I will not uh, really go into details because time is not there. Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly I will highlight some of them. And how in recent times, you know, it has really helped us. Uh, you know, but then if you see uh, how technology is the driver of change and, uh, you know, uh, how this imperative uh, need uh, has been addressed to a certain extent, uh, but then the regional disparity is quite glaring. If you talk of Punjab and the way they adopt new seeds, uh, if you take, there are, uh, there are IPRI studies and Dr. P.K. Joshi, uh, they uh, earlier had a uh, you know, study done for NABAD and uh, also IPRI has also done some studies and there are other independent studies and uh, very clearly revealing the differential uh, adoption of technologies across regions. Uh, and there is uh, no single uh, you know, kind of rule uh, that applies across the country. It's a very, very complex situation with regard to technology adoption and scaling. And there lies the problem. And unless we address that, we will not be able to have uh, you know, further uh, you know, enhancement in pharmacy income and in the process of raising rural poverty. Uh, because uh, pharmacy income, which is uh, hovering around say about 7,000 rupees uh, you know, uh, per month, less than that in fact, so uh, we will not be able to address. Uh, but to leave aside what we are actually giving uh, to farmers in the form of uh, you know, direct benefit transfer and all that, I'm not going to the details, but that's the kind of income. So, so how do we really address this? Uh, so uh, the technology in the form of new seeds, if you see, the way it is accepted in uh, Punjab, uh, if you take SD 2967 of wheat or SD 3086 of wheat, the way they are accepted, uh, you know, uh, the kind of replacement that has happened very quickly, variety replacement happens, a uh, very quick hap replacement happens in Punjab, Haryana, and uh, in some of the other states as compared to uh, other regions of the country, say Eastern region, even in Andhra Pradesh, where you see the rice varieties continuously getting evolved, the old variety replacement uh, doesn't really happen uh, as per expectations, quite low. And uh, you know, as, as it is revealed by very systematic analysis. But if you see in Punjab, the replacement of rice variety, Pusa 44, doesn't happen, <clears throat> despite the fact that there are other varieties. But that has not really been, uh, not been replaced as much as it was required. Uh, in recent years, our uh, specific thrust in, uh, you know, introducing early maturing varieties, uh, direct seeding and so on and so forth has led to very significant change. Uh, but, uh, you know, till uh, recent years, it was PUSA 44, which was uh, a ruling and it's a very long duration, it has its own negative impacts, but still farmers were persisting. With that. So there are preferences of the farmers which needs to be really recognized and the process, uh, you know, very systematically, uh, there's a need to work with them uh, so that the attitude changes happen uh, at that level. Not easy, uh, our chemical system is working very closely with the farmers, but it has been really very tough. And if you see in general, Eastern region is laggard with regard to accepting new technologies, even in Odisha, the new rice varieties, are not really accepted. The old varieties like Swarna and Swarna Savan, they continue ruling. And even uh, CRRI variety Puja still being cultivated in case of rice in large areas and Navin, for instance. So there are many varieties, old varieties, more than 30 year old varieties. They are still uh, being continued uh, being cultivated and the newer ones not being able to replace them. So varietal replacement not really happening as much as possible. There are many, many uh, reasons uh, for this, and there are motivations uh, you know, which are required for replacement. And there are various uh, factors of motivation and incentivization, and also the compulsions uh, through policy measures. And I'll come back to policy a little later, 
but uh, I may not have sufficient time to really highlight each one of them. Very briefly, I'll touch upon all these imperatives in agriculture so that we actually address holistically uh, the uh, agricultural needs so that we have a better situation with regard to poverty alleviation uh, in the country. And particularly the rural poverty, which is uh, still uh, persisting and uh, troubling us. And uh, the global hunger index, as we are ranked, uh, you know, is a matter of concern, as you all know. So, so coming back to the point I was highlighting, uh, the Bihar example, if you see, uh, the acceptance of the single cross hybrid in case of maize. And in a very remote area, uh, you know, uh, in a patch uh, where you never expect that new technology would be accepted, it has been accepted and quite a huge uh, yield, uh, uh, you know, benefit the farmers are getting and good value chain being developed and, uh, you know, for feed purpose, uh, the procurement happening by the industry and, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, value chain operational, uh, you know, for some time now. And successful model, uh, you know, you see uh, in a scattered manner uh, across the country. So, you know, th there are many lessons to learn from this. And this is uh, the, uh, the first imperative need that first of all, we need to have uh, those disruptive technologies uh, to actually drive uh, the uh, adoption uh, by the farms uh, and uh, replace uh, the old ones uh, you know, uh, uh, with a substantial advantage. Farmers see economic benefit uh, than anything else. So more the economic advantage uh, and better is the adoption rate, quicker is the adoption, and in the process, uh, you know, a more profit to the farmers. So and obviously, uh, the uh, the uh, societal needs are met, and the process, you know, uh, we have more uh, development happen. So, so that is the kind of situation as you see. And Dr. Josie's analysis in that uh, NABAR sponsored uh, work very clearly it has been described that how in recent times the pulses revolution happened and the policy of the government that uh, the old seed, old varieties would not be there in the seed chain. And the Indians must happen only for uh, less than 10 year old varieties. And that led to a replacement to the tune of 80, 85% of the old varieties of pulses. And, uh, and uh, giving uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, this pulses revolution uh, to the tune of 10 million tons of extra production uh, you know, during past five, six years. And you see starting from 6 million tons advantage to, to the tune of 10 million tons last year, 10 million tons higher production as compared to you know, what we had uh, before uh, even 15, 16. Uh, so, so that is the kind of uh, you know, uh, varietal replacement, very well planned, very systematically implemented, providing seeds through seed hubs, through, you know, bitter seed supply and eliminating old varieties and enhancing productivity. And in the process uh, also uh, by way of government policy, increasing area uh, under pulses and uh, contributing to this development. And if this continues, uh, the needs of uh, you know, PGNP and also to certain extent uh, the lentil uh, for which we are importing, that would be uh, you know, certainly met. <clears throat> so this is the recent example of technology policy and uh, disruptive technology uh, you know, example, uh, you know, CO238, I keep uh, you know, citing this example again and again, and that is an excellent analysis by uh, you know uh, a reporter uh, you know uh, that you can see in the next place he works uh, you know uh, I can I can uh, you know tell that elaborate analysis he has done and uh, you can see that how CO two thirty eight has brought a sugar revolution in the country particularly in UP the area spread happening to the tune of you know, 90%, more than 85% area being occupied by uh, this particular, uh, you know, variety, uh, CO238, and bringing sugar revolution and sugar production going up to even 34, 35 million tons. And of course, 
uh, you know, other varieties of uh, 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 SBI uh, contributing to these uh, developments. So a disruptive technology, uh, innovation, and contributing to societal needs. We have done detailed analysis of uh, the uh, economic advantage the farmers are getting. It's not just the economic advantage, the kind of uh, environmental benefits where these technologies are uh, actually giving is uh, tremendous. And we do not often measure uh, the environmental benefits uh, as a part of societal needs. The society does not actually realize the environmental, uh, the issue of environmental benefits. Uh, so uh, when we, holistic development, we talk about multidimensionality of the poverty we talk about, this holistic approach uh, is taken into account. So environmental benefit of this technology, as I said, of CO238 is tremendous. Why I say so? Because primarily uh, the excess uh, sugarcane juice is being diverted for bioethanol production and bioethanol uh, leading to substitution of 10% of uh, petrol uh, and in the that is the blending taking place and obviously the fossil fuel uh, replaced to the tune of 10, 20% and now uh, aiming for 20% replacement. And this is a very big change. And that is what is called uh, a kind of a revolution. And uh, you know, uh, not just sugar revolution, but revolution with regard to the environmental uh, security and sustainability. And uh, you know, uh, uh, the, and you have seen that uh, how the waste utilization would ha happen for bioethanol production in Haryana and dedication of that bioethanol plant uh, by Honorable Prime Minister to the nation. So, so this is what is uh, actually uh, you know progressing very well. And I'm sure when the circular economy that we talk about, and this is another uh, you know uh, uh, agricultural imperative that how in agriculture. Uh, the circular economy must operate and uh, to have a maximum environmental benefits and environmental sustainability. And this, is, this has to be our focus in years to come. Uh, the traditional agriculture has been focusing on uh, the circularity without realizing, without someone pointing out the circular economy is important. Traditionally, our farmers have been practicing circular economy. And uh, uh, you know the cow dung being uh, utilized in uh, you know uh, agriculture, the agricultural waste being incorporated, uh, and uh, uh, lesser dependent on chemical fertilizers uh, and uh, the water and all that uh, you know being harvested in ponds and ponds being utilized for irrigation. As I said, uh, starting from uh, Indus Valley civilization, how elaborate uh, water conservation and harvesting systems were planned how the water was utilized very judiciously, particularly in arid regions of the country. You know, there are all examples before us that how we were actually working. And, but then we lost uh, our way sometime uh, in between. And today we are being advised about circular economy. And today, never mind, we have to really re rework on the strategy and rediscover our own strength uh, uh, that we had in the past and then go back to the circular economy. How do we really best utilize uh, our uh, bioresources, the agri waste, uh, so that uh, we improve our, this is, this imperative uh, need is uh, very much there. And I'm sure we need to really focus on this. But when I say a corollary of this is that how do we actually extend this uh, to have a nature positive agriculture? And this is in the context of strengthening the environmental health. And we have been really talking about, and the Prime Minister has been focusing on and emphasizing about, and what is that we need to really do when we talk of nature positive agriculture. Uh, the, the traditional system uh, you know, uh, needs to be really revisited. Uh, the the uh, Vedic and subsequent era, uh, the the uh, you know uh, uh, our civilizational uh, you know or kind of uh, situations which are prevailing uh, in those Indus Valley civilizations, and subsequently how we are really managing and what is science behind that, and what extent uh, we can actually have uh, more science uh, and then evidence based approaches are there in place 
and so that there is more of nature positive agriculture. Someone certainly would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, thrusting upon us, uh, you know, uh, concepts like uh, regenerative agriculture. We always go by what is being developed uh, outside, and you might have seen, which is in circulation, how, uh, you know, we are losing out with regard to our lifestyle and how we are aping uh, the West and how, uh, you know, uh, in the process we are losing out and how the West is going, uh, you know, trying to come back to Indian uh, system of traditional system of living. So there are now uh, kind of situations and the circularity uh, in the cycle in, the, in that thing that one has to really notice. Anyway, coming back to the point I was trying to make is that how do we actually uh, use our waste and in the process uh, uh, recycle and then gain from that? Uh, uh, you know, how do we really uh, you know, reflect that in our policy? Uh, 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 we do have, we, we had discussion on ecosystem services and how do we actually make payment for ecosystem services? There is carbon trading, which is there global level, which is in place, but it's at the very early stage of development in the country. Uh, even globally, uh, huge carbon trading in agriculture is not happening. And but then we have several avenues to really work on. Uh, you know, uh, our agri policy uh, imperative uh, uh, is very much there uh, to address this particular aspect. Uh, how do we really link? Uh, uh, incentivization in agriculture with uh, ecosystem uh, services. The performance uh, ecos with regard to ecosystem services, uh, you know, performance linked incentives. We are talking about the PLI uh, and many other programs, but here is the imperative need uh, to really have a PLI, uh, you know, where uh, you can link uh, performance with regard to ecosystem services. Uh, and uh, link our subsidy system or all other things that we do, even direct benefit system, our fertilizer uh, use system, and all that, even water use system and everything with uh, the advantage or incentives that we provide to the farmers. Uh, there is a need to really go deeper with regard to policies, which are very much required. And in the process, uh, you know, uh, with this imperative need, uh, in agriculture, so that the society uh, uh, not only harvests the full benefit with regard to environmental benefits, with regard to environmental health uh, that uh, you know uh, we require, uh, and obviously uh, nature positive agriculture needs to really mainstream and rather take full advantage of uh, the uh, you know uh, power of microbes. And we have not really studied this uh, in entirety. Of course, in entirety, it's difficult to study, but uh, there is plenty of opportunity for us uh, to capitalize on this strength of this country and uh, the microbe power has to be unleashed. And how do we really unleash the microbial power? And uh, there is plenty of opportunity. Uh, I'm sure we should be able to really uh, you know, or, or take advantage of this. Uh, there are various approaches, uh, not going to those details, whether it is conservation agriculture, the hero delays and so on and so forth. So many things people talk about and uh, to, so that we have uh, land restoration happening, uh, less of land degradation happening. And then we have more of regenerative systems there, more of environmental benefits there. And uh, the farmers not only get profit, adequate profit, if they are losing out in certain situations, there is a compensatory mechanism in place uh, so that the economic uh, benefits uh, are taken care, uh, uh, so that the environmental benefits are mainstreamed. And this is an imperative need in agriculture. And more and more discussion must happen, more for that more of policy interventions are there in place and we have more scientific evidences are in place uh, for uh, you know, uh, providing adequate support to policy making. And I believe uh, we should be able to really do that and uh, needs partnership with the global players. 
and needs partnership with the industry. We have started in small way, uh, IRI is working and other institutions are working, but there's a long way to go. And I, I believe very strongly uh, that uh, uh, you know, we would uh, succeed uh, in this particular aspect. So technology mainstreaming, disruptive technology requirement and uh, uh, removing regional disparity and going for more of uh, adoption of new technology, they are all essential, but without compromising uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, environmental health. And that's what uh, my emphasis is. And everybody talks about it. I am putting in different format uh, in the form of agricultural imperatives, but they are all essential needs. And all of you know this. But when we talk about this, I want to enhance productivity. I don't want to really compromise. And obviously, keeping in view the population growth, which is happening, keeping in view uh, the, uh, the, the requirements, particularly with regard to uh, the uh, staple foods or edible oils, obviously, we have to con continue doing uh, you know, uh, the integrated nutrient management and the process that have full advantage. But given the kind of surpluses we have today, the imperative need today is surplus management. The surplus management is the imperative need. Not just by creating big warehouses we'll be able to really manage our surpluses. There has to be adequate processing happening um, from less than 5% to say 20% processing happening. But in the process, I don't want to really emphasize that we must not be, uh, you know, con we should be always consuming processed food. So we must be really consuming fresh food as much as possible, but the excess of that should be going to processing for value addition, discovery of new molecules, having nutraceutical properties, for instance, and uh, you know, I isolating, say, lycopene, isolating for other coloring substances, and isolating uh, you know, substances of nutraceutical value or even pharmaceutical value, and even uh, you know, uh, like bioethanol and uh, even biofertilizers and so on and so forth. So we have plenty of opportunity to utilize our excess production. So surplus management needs innovative technologies. Surplus management needs uh, use of technologies like blockchain. We have hardly used this tool and technology in Indian agriculture. So there is an imperative need to actually uh, you know, mainstream uh, use of artificial intelligence and blockchain and machine learning in this particular arena of managing our surpluses. We created an institution, renamed institution uh, called, uh, now we call uh, National Institute of Secondary Agriculture. It is not just to uh, you know, uh, symbolize uh, secondary agriculture. Secondary agriculture is important, but more than that, what is important is that pushing the institute, pushing the thinking process, the thought process in that direction to think out of box so that you have innovations there, disruptive innovations coming out, and we are able to really create industry in the process where value addition is taking place and plenty of uh, new products coming and uh, to the market and, and the industry partnership happening from the beginning. So the market driven research happening uh, in the new institute called National Institute of Secondary Agriculture. And uh, similarly, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, National Institute of Commercial Agriculture that you have created and uh, in the process uh, renaming uh, and uh, uh, redefining the mandate of institute uh, on tobacco research. So, so these are the kind of steps which have been taken and uh, with well thought out mandates and uh, they will have uh, uh, very, very important implications in the future if we work further very systematically. And uh, for both the institutes, we work on uh, you know, uh, uh, collaborations, uh, you know, also industry partnership from the very beginning and define what should be done in commercial agriculture, where lies the importance, 
not just to grow chili, but using chili for a purpose and uh, deriving uh, something out of it and, uh, and also meeting the global needs uh, in the industry uh, or even uh, you know, otherwise. Uh, so that is the kind of uh, requirement uh, one has to really uh, deliberate and uh, discuss uh, and then uh, in the process manage the surplus and create wealth and the process create a wealthy society meet the societal needs and the farmers are wealthier and uh, uh, in the process uh, you know society is wealthy and there is a uh, you know reduction in poverty and malnutrition <clears throat> of course <clears throat> when you say that you have to reduce uh, this uh, surplus in certain crops we say you diversify <clears throat> And diversify to what? Diversify to horticulture, diversify to integrated agriculture, and uh, you know, uh, dairy, uh, fishery, and so on and so forth. And well, that is very, very important. And we have been talking about integrated agricultural practices, integrated agriculture, but there has to be a paradigm shift in our thinking process. Uh, the policy makers, and the uh, kind of uh, economic analysis that we do, always we say that a farm and a non-farm and put some of these activities as a non-farm activities. And that is a great fallacy uh, in what we are actually talking about. When we say that agriculture is animal agriculture, this is uh, horticulture as a part of agriculture and all included for the sake of analysis, one can separate out but with regard to farmer, we say it's all an integrated approach. These are all farming and animal farming is a part of crop farming or horticulture farming. So this dichotomy in our planning process, in our thinking process must start from our analysis process and the economic analysis process. And then only we'll be able to mainstream them. Why I say so? that when we say that there is a dichotomy in this, we say the growth in a crop sector is low, but what is important, and this year we have impact of a high heat, and we were in a serious trauma that, uh, you know, what will happen if wheat production comes down, uh, and how can we really uh, have this uh, supply of food, uh, you know, to more than, uh, you know, 80% uh, of the population, poor people uh, through public distribution. And uh, you know, similarly, we said rice can be provided, but many uh, you know consumers don't require wheat. So I'll take a little more time. So hopefully, we'll be able to really finish uh, in uh, another 10, 15 minutes. So, <clears throat> so we should be really careful in our planning and uh, the discussion. There has to be a paradigm shift. Can we compromise with the production of staples? Uh, we cannot. And if we do that and uh, we cannot sustain feeding uh, this huge population. And poverty, addressing poverty, multidimensional poverty has to primarily address the hunger, uh, the, the hunger as it is defined that the food needs. And unless the staple requirement is met, you can't dilute that. But at the same time, how do we really promote? It cannot be distribution of poverty and distribution of poverty with regard to funding among this. There has to be increase in investment. We must realize you cannot redistribute that less money among sectors. So sectors have to be enriched. There has to be doubling of research component of the investment. And uh, this, uh, you know, maybe 200 to 500,000 crores is not a big deal uh, with regard to research investment. So private investment must come and private components of uh, funding research must really come forward. And that uh, we have started this process and I believe uh, it will be taken forward and we should be able to really harness more of that. But what I was trying to say is that when we branch out and have more funding for horticulture and dairy and fishery sector, then we must have a clarity with regard to how much we must produce. As we have troubles with regard to managing surplus in respect of cereals, we will have terrible problem with managing surplus with regard to horticulture produce and even with milk and fish. And uh, you know, so this needs to be really well thought out 
and how much we should produce with regard to horticulture. And unless we have, we have one district, one product, but uh, you know, there also, there are uh, duplications and we need to really relook at it and the planning has to start. A policy framework has to be in place. It is not agroecology based uh, you know, crop planning. There has to be demand supply uh, playing a very big role uh, in this uh, you know, agricultural imperative and agricultural imperative. And this particular aspect has to be really looked at very, very critically. What is that we need in case of horticulture? It gives more return, perfectly all right, but how much we can manage and uh, otherwise we can't export and for export what we need. And obviously there is another imperative that is food safety and quality imperative. And how much we have been able to really meet this quality imperative. Our All India Coordinated System uh, uh, on pesticide residue tells us not more than 2% of the samples have uh, you know, pesticide and uh, above the permissible limit. So, uh, you know, uh, these are all average, but then there are regions, there are uh, situations, there are crop commodities where there is higher level than the permissible limit. So, MRN. So, given this, that we need to really be careful, and we have produce which is getting rejected when they are exported, and particularly the European Union, which is very, very uh, strict about that. So, food safety and quality imperative is a very essential component for India. How do we really do this? So, so managing this, uh, you know, with regard to, you know, right kind of policy and right kind of uh, awareness, right kind of technology, the blast disease resistance in case of, uh, uh, you know, our basmati rice is essential. And that has to go large scale. We keep developing new varieties, but the blast resistance combined with the other important you know, traits must go to the field and large scale it must occupy so that the uh, fungal uh, resistance management happens and we are able to address uh, the uh, residue uh, you know, uh, uh, very well and our export doesn't get impacted in the process. And this has to happen with regard to milk. This has to happen with regard to horticultural produce. The traceability in the process has to be in place. They are all which are being talked about, but I believe there is an imperative need to have more discussion and more implementation of all these, more research. I don't think we have now enough research. My colleagues who are attending will take this very seriously that how do we really address this imperative need in this particular segment? We can produce more, but we will be in deep trouble if we do not have quality, we do not have safety management happening side by side, and your all processing value addition will fall flat, and we cannot win the global markets. And the five trillion economy, 12 trillion, 10 trillion US dollar economy, and contribution of agriculture in the process, all these that we have been discussing uh, would not be really satisfied. Forget about societal benefits that we are talking about. And how do we actually, in the process, uh, bring about this change? And what should be the institutional framework that we would like to really strengthen? And the rural infrastructure and all that uh, which need to be really uh, strengthened uh, in the process. And uh, you, know, uh, you, you know very well that how uh, this is happening otherwise. Uh, you know, uh, in certain instances, I'll cite one example that of how it is happening. And if you take the example of uh, Andhra Pradesh and where, uh, you know, uh, the uh, system of uh, um, technology mainstreaming and the state coming in in a big way, uh, working very well and uh, creating and strengthening local institution is a very important aspect of uh, you know, agricultural imperative. The Raitu Bharosa Kendra is a beautiful example which is being implemented in Andhra Pradesh. I'm sure my colleagues would be very much tired and I have spoken for about an uh, about a, uh, hour, so uh, may not like to listen any further, but it's an imperative need for all of us to study that system how it works, 
how the digital platform is working so well, how data driven it is, how the input supply system is inbuilt, how the farmer's information system, starting from the land information to crop information is being mainstreamed and how the agricultural experts providing guidance to the farmers is being provided and how the youngsters, particularly young professionals, are providing solutions at the grassroots level. And uh, these, uh, you know, right to Barasa Kendras, more than 10,700 of them, which are operating, and, uh, you know, more than 32 lakh farmers, uh, you know, uh, procuring seed by using right to Barasa Kendras. And all the inputs quality being analyzed before supply happening. Not only quality seed, even fertilizer being procured by 10 lakh farmers. And farmers, almost 4 lakh, getting credit through these kendras. And more than 15 lakh farmers uh, selling their produce at MSP uh, through these uh, Raitu Barosa kendras. And even products like a ragi, produce like a ragi being sold uh, through this. And this is a kind of system. I believe that we need to really study this first of all and how it is working as a system. And we say there is no adoption, but I believe that if we plan holistically, the farmers not only would accept technology and that will be scaling up happening. Dr. Joseph's analysis in that number supported word, which is says the differential scaling up happening with regard to technology and variety of food factors influencing uh, the uh, adoption process and motivation, uh, you know, getting influenced by a variety of factors, and all these would be addressed to a great extent that if we actually have a system like this, and we will have economists actually doing a great job there, the extension scientists actually understanding how this extension model can work, how this societal development model can work, and how farmers are benefiting and how agriculture can gain tremendously from this model. And in fact, the digital kind of push which has been given, there are kiosks and farmers can learn about the price. And there is also <clears throat> uh, farmers getting, uh, you know, the, for instance, uh, PM Kisan, uh, you know, uh, someone with the uh, funds getting through right, right to Barasa Ken. And uh, the, the, the kind of status of, uh, you know, uh, the crop growth, uh, being there. Uh, so, so everything, all information being provided there, uh, you know, is a beautiful example of, uh, you know, mainstreaming institutions. And this is one institution, so it's the imperative need to understand. There are other examples in other states, and I believe that uh, as a scientific organization, the apex body, uh, we must study and even, uh, you know, learn from the experiences and then see if there are gaps. In fact, we have a tripartite agreement, ICR, FAO, and AP government. They're working together in this to strengthen this further uh, and then see how best we can actually address this. Youth uh, is another imperative need, youth strengthening and attracting them, motivating them. Uh, Dr. Purudas uh, you know, pushed to Maya, motivating and attracting youth uh, to agriculture. And our own ICR's program of attracting and retaining youth in agriculture, that is uh, ARIA. Uh, you know, also they're all uh, very, very important concepts. Thousands of uh, youths have been trained and thousands, more than 50,000, initiating uh, their own enterpri enterprises. And in fact, those which uh, return, uh, who returned home after COVID, uh, you, know, uh, you know, more than 60,000 of them which were trained by our KVKs, and of course, 15% of them are starting their own enterprises. And in the process, getting retained in villages. There are beautiful examples of attracting youth, including women to agriculture, but believing that the farmer's son or farmer's children, uh, daughters, they have to work in farm. I think that is, there is a fallacy in our thought process. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to really get out of this. A thought process. Uh, you know, uh, everybody is aspirational. Ours is an aspirational society, and that aspiration is everywhere. And let the youth of a farmer, the children of farmer, think about 
becoming a civil servant or IAS, or becoming an engineer or doctor, not necessarily farmer. But who would be a farmer? If, uh, those who have the right kind of uh, you know, uh, inclination. And how do we really build this inclination? And starting from our school days, and uh, school curriculum has to change. Dr. Agrawal uh, had a kind of uh, uh, discussion on this. How do we really stand, uh, change levels and have specific topics and subjects like agriculture, not only at the early school stage, even higher secondary level, and uh, you know, orient students, those who are interested to have their own enterprise in agriculture, profitable enterprises in agriculture. We are doing handhelding through entrepreneurship development. We have various programs. We have incubation centers, very well done, but that's not really enough. Why? Our own analysis in National Academy of Agriculture Sciences uh, to, uh, you know, about our uh, you know, startups and entrepreneurship reveals that there are issues and problems, a number of problems and issues are to be really addressed. So this imperative need that attracting youth, retaining them requires a big kind of push and a lot of actually gaps are there which need to be really addressed. Motivating youth requires you know, uh, uh, a lot of things to be really done. Uh, the cognitive theory of motivation and uh, goal setting and also incentive, incentive theory and all that that we read in textbooks need to be really worked out very well. And how do we really incentivize? How do we really work out the need and create the need? And how do we really play with the instinct uh, of uh, the, the youth uh, so that uh, you know they are oriented towards agriculture. It is not just compelling them and giving a slogan that uh, the children of farmer has to go for farming. So, so there is a need to really work on this. And in this context, you all know that the uh, Maslow's uh, need uh, hierarchy and uh, Maslow's need hierarchy talks about self-actualization but there are five important steps. The physiological needs are to be met primarily. The food, clothing, shelter, sleep, reproduction, air, water needs of the uh, individual has to be met. The societal needs which are physiological in nature are to be met. And obviously to climb the ladder, unless we meet this, probably uh, climbing up would be difficult. Although there is no dependency, one can move still independently. The safety needs, love and belongingness needs, and esteem needs, and self-actualization needs, and all these are very, very important. But the need of the youth needs to be really analyzed to motivate them, to change their attitude. The IITNs are coming back to agriculture because they see the challenge. So there is something to motivate them. There is a technology in the form of digital technologies to motivate them and uh, there is a profit which is motivating them, profit from digital agriculture or precision agriculture. The precision agriculture needs uh, are to be met and youth is there and getting attracted, IITNs are getting attracted uh, towards this particular aspect. So how do we really do this and uh, you know, motivate them? And, and unless we have this and our extension specialists are to be really uh, go deeper in motivation, understand the needs at what stage farmers are. And I'll cite one example that we have given a Padma Sri to about 20 farmers during past five, six years. We not only identified them and uh, uh, you know, nominated them, even recommended some of those names, and we feel proud that we have uh, helped them uh, to be recognized. But this is very, very important, very, very important that is the esteem need of farmers. We never thought that uh, the farmers who are doing subsistence farming and uh, that will be, they will be aspirational and that will be esteem need and the esteem need of the farmers getting fulfilled by way of this recognition. But there are many complications there. And obviously the complication is how do they continue contributing to what they are doing and succeeding in the process. There could be situations of failures. 
and a hand holding would be critical so that they contribute. But at the same time, how they can be used to motivate others. We have 20 of them. We have 75,000 farmers whose income have been doubled during the past five years, and we have documented them. How do we use them as motivational leaders, and as uh, you know, uh, uh, farmers uh, you know, uh, who can actually do hand holding? And I believe uh, this requires our deep thought and uh, you know, use of this uh, uh, you know, can be mainstream. And uh, Maslow's uh, need hierarchy analysis says, and our traditional uh, you know, uh, um, kind of uh, national demonstration which was conducted uh, says that farmers to farmer learning uh, you know, would be very crucial uh, in scaling up and the process uh, enhancing technology penetration and in the process providing a greater benefit to the society. So, so this aspect uh, needs, uh, you know, a, a well, uh, you know, a deeper thoughts. The deficiency needs are to be met. The growth needs are to be met uh, of the society and particularly of the farmers, uh, so that we have more of, uh, you know, farmers coming to this fold and hand holding happening. If seventy-five thousand farmers can do hand holding, it can reach seventy-five lakhs in another five years. And uh, that is how you can get scaled up and the process, the country is covered uh, by uh, that uh, process. Uh, but then uh, when we do all this, and if we take into account the kind of uh, global challenges which are there before us, uh, on a certainly uh, we can't really neglect the developments which are actually happening all around us. Uh, India's uh, digital uh, you know, revolution uh, is one, and this uh, digital imperative in agriculture cannot be uh, undermined. Uh, we have initiated a national project on precision agriculture. It's only a beginning. I saw the other day we had a review, but there's a very little uh, funding provided. There is a requirement of massive investment. Government of India is doing, but in agriculture, this investment is so little. And we need to really look at our phrase and we can work with industry, we can work with the entrepreneurs, the startups, and then see how we actually be a player, a big player in digital agriculture revolution, in precision agriculture revolution. There are plenty of examples, precision irrigation system, for instance, in Israel, or for that matter, many parts of the US, and how this precision agriculture works, drone-based agriculture, or sensor-based agriculture, all these are there for us. But what should be the plan of action for us? That, uh, you know, there is opportunity, no doubt. And uh, I'm sure. But what is required? The data analytics, data-driven digital agriculture, whether data, market data, as I said, Raitu Bharata Gorosa Kendras are working in this direction. And similarly, the uh, farmers and entrepreneurs require capacity building and training. And who would meet this? Our own scientific community has to be really trained for this. And unless we do that, I don't think we'll be able to really address the digital agriculture imperative uh, of uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the country. And uh, I'm sure as we go along, uh, we should be able to really meet this uh, requirement. There are various other needs and imperative needs. I'll not go into those details. But uh, what is the uh, you know, scope of uh, we joining hands and then working together and uh, accelerating what we are doing? For instance, uh, I, when I say that uh, we would like to really have more of uh, interface uh, uh, for adoption of technology, and mainstreaming of nature positive agriculture and more of a uh, farm gate uh, you know, processing value addition happening and so on and so forth. That uh, can we really strengthen our own activity? For instance, we initiated uh, you know, a Miragaon, Miragaon, scientist, uh, you know, farmer interaction. Where we are, are we successful in this? A critical internal review should start and then we should go for external review. And this needs strengthening. Can we really uh, you know, see if we are succeeding in 13,500 villages? 
Can we move to another 13,500 villages uh, you know, nearby or uh, far off places so that the cluster is built and we have more villages coming into the fold of farmer scientist interaction, farmer uh, scientists directly contributing to developments that uh, whether it is micro irrigation, organic farming, all that we talk about and uh, or uh, you know vaccination happening, artificial insemination happening, the feed, local feed system, uh, you know, green fodder production happening, all that we talk about, you know, can we really enhance this up and uh, you know uh, through Miragao, Miragora program, scientist farmer interaction program. This would be an example to set uh, before the global community that how we can actually you know, sustain the society. So to sum it up, what is that I wanted to uh, uh, tell and what message I wanted to give? The message is that the science-driven development of the society. Society cannot prosper if we do not have you know, uh, uh, innovative science and technology, evidence-based policy making, as we have seen, starting from uh, the uh, Indus Valley civilization, until date, we must really focus on this. And this is the imperative need. And if we do not really uh, do this, we will be uh, uh, there where we are. Uh, the poverty reduction rate would not increase. There are a lot of schemes of the government which are working. I have highlighted some of them and how we can be a big player in the whole uh, change that is happening. Let's be a part of the whole change and be a change maker and in the process contribute to development. And farmers' empowerment is important. Youth and women empowerment is important. And I have described all this when you were talking about agricultural imperatives in days ahead. So with these, uh, let me profusely thank you that uh, you have given me extra time and uh, more than 450 people are still there uh, listening to what I spoke, uh, speaking about. And uh, it is not that entirely I say everything new, but putting those together in a different manner to bring a perspective uh, to agricultural imperatives so that we build a better society, a prosperous <laughs> society, a uh, you know society where poverty perishes and we have uh, nutrition all around. We address malnutrition and we have uh, agro industry growing, youth in the process, and women empowered. So with these words, thank you everybody. Uh, <laughs> so thanks, Dr. Agarwal. So I stop here. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, a very elaborative description. Uh, of this science-led uh, development for the society and what can be the imperative role of this agriculture. I think you have not left any dimension, whether it's a digital, whether it's education, whether it's a climate change, the holistic approach, water, soil, animal science, uh, the, the poverty, uh, the, the various schemes of the government, disruptive technologies, uh, I think every aspect, whatever is possible, has been covered by you nicely. And that shows that how much uh, in-depth knowledge you have got because uh, heading the ICR for such a long period, uh, you have the multidimensional experience, you have the multidimensional contribution. And uh, that also uh, shows us, I'm also happy to inform you that in the 74 lectures, we have the maximum number of participants today. The, uh, the, the maximum limit was 500 and uh, there were more persons in the waiting room but uh, we could not allow but I think uh, through Facebook they must have uh, uh, enjoyed this they must have listened to you and in many uh, uh, institutes uh, there were uh, students and the staff sitting in the halls so uh, I could see in some of the halls people uh, in the 50s or in the 60 numbers they were sitting so uh, I think it's a very educative lecture, sir, and I'm really uh, thankful to you for uh, uh, agreeing to deliver this le uh, lecture on our uh, continuous insistence and uh, really making this lecture series very important. And I think the idea of having this 75 lecture series 
was also uh, your uh, vision and we know your vision has really helped icr in in, uh, in many ways uh, we can see uh, uh, the many activities which i have seen uh, in this 75 lecture series also uh, sir because uh, 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 we are uh, lacking time now so i will not be able to take up the questions or i will not be able to uh, invite uh, anybody else for this uh, for the comments but uh, maybe for uh, few uh, minutes one or two minutes i can just ask uh, uh, first uh, professor gautam uh, if you have anything to say uh, regarding this uh, lecture professor gautam sir can you unmute yourself yeah uh thank you dr agrawal for uh, giving me time despite the times uh, you know constraint uh well dr mahapatra this was a very very interesting uh, lecture uh first of course uh, when you i just heard about the topic i said uh, i thought it will be just general thing but uh, you traveled uh, through various uh, you know areas and uh, uh, really enlightened us all about uh, your views on uh, the how the technology should go how innovation should be taken and how the policies and the synergy of uh, technologies the policies and uh, the scientists and institution and the private sector is uh, critical for addressing the needs and the uh, problems of the society uh, not much to say because it was very very interesting very exhaustive and uh, you have done the best justice uh, to the presentation congratulations to you thank you so much and uh, we look forward for hearing from you thank you sir thank so you today in audience we had uh, professor abhi singh we had dr madan we had dr bram singh we had dr gajen singh Uh, we have a lot of uh, eminent persons who are present, and a word of uh, 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 blessings we can have uh, uh, briefly from Professor Abhi Singh. Uh, Professor Abhi Singh, sir, can you unmute yourself? And just a brief uh, a word of blessing. Ah, uh, is it? Uh... Yes, sir. We are able to listen to you. First of all, let me say that uh, uh, Professor Mahapatra, such a comprehensive lecture. As a matter of fact, science to serve society, and uh, the the various components that society has to deal with, right from poverty, hunger, undernutrition, malnutrition, inequity, and so on and so forth, the climate change, you name it. also the quality consideration and exports uh, the value additions the value chain you just name it my goodness i tell you such a comprehensive lecture in one hour i have never heard and uh, you have covered everything uh, i this this speaks volumes for the kind of you know uh, learning process that you have uh, gone through and assimilated the entire situation in such a way that it speaks uh, for the uh, for the system and we are extremely grateful to you for this very we we pray that we we have more opportunities to listen to you yeah. and we would certainly like you to continue guiding us in in many ways that you can and uh, we would uh, certainly see that our farmers benefit ultimately it is ultimately it is the farmers it is the men women particularly the young youth and the women uh, must be encouraged to to really take the leadership and looking at your leadership hopefully they would be able to inherit something in that direction how the leadership can really make a difference so we are very grateful to you uh, god bless you and we we really want you to continue stronger and stronger and give keep guiding us in the process thank you thank very you. much thank and, you sir and uh, i wish so, you all the best <laughs> so thank you all friends and uh, special thanks to uh, professor uh, mahapatra
for uh, this enlightening talk and uh, sharing his experiences. Uh, I think uh, many of uh, whatever he has spoken, he is a man of action. He has already implemented in ICR. Uh, you can see a lot of changes now in various platforms, digital platforms, education and climate and uh, through this Nikola project, through many, uh, many things. So thank you, sir, for sharing your experiences, rich experiences. And I, I want to just request all of you that the 75th lecture, to summarize this 75th lecture series, is being uh, taken by uh, none other than our Honorable Agriculture Minister on 16th of August at 12.30. So uh, I request all of you to join. I'll just provide the link. So with that, uh, I again thank you and sorry for uh, uh, taking time out of your lunch. Thank you and Namaskar. Thank you, Namaskar. Namaskar to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Arvind Singh. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.